Hey Nathan here, welcome back to another video covering Mono Game Advanced. In this video, we are going to discuss binding objects to a rectangle. Last video, we discussed rectangular collision detection and how to make one object collides with another. We also discussed an issue with that being that if you have a object that looks like a circle or a triangle or something that's not square you're gonna have a lot of transparent pixels around and that's going to have false positives depending on where the other sprite is and it's just rectangular collision detection is a nice fast way to test to see if one object is in another object's rectangle uh, in the later videos uh, next one I believe we will discuss a deeper collision detection, which is per pixel collision detection. But before I do that, I want to discuss the opposite of what we discussed last video. We want to, in some games, we want to bind objects to a rectangle. For example, let's take the any platformer, uh, the classic Mario games, just any platformer, and let's say we have an object, a enemy, or a power-up or something on a platform that's just going to left and right, and it's just going back and forth. That is bound to a rectangle. There are lots of ways that you can do that. The easiest way is just to bind it to a rectangle, and if it goes outside that rectangle, you can either have it change directions or just stay at that side. We are going to do the second thing in this video, which is to have it stay on that side. So this is, I've already created the solution and copied and pasted the newer code. This is the code we just did last video, where it's just going to test to see rectangular collision detection. And I'm just going to do some modifications. Alright, so let's go into the code here. And this will be provided in the download. So just download the previous tutorial sample, and you can follow me from there. Alright, so the first thing we want to do is create a private field up here. And that's going to hold the rectangle. And it's going to be nullable. So put a question mark there. And it's just going to be the bound. So we're going to bind a object to a, a bounds. So if, it, if that exists, that can be null. So if it's not bound, that will be null. But if it is bound, we will test to see if it is going outside those bounds and do our logic appropriately. So now we need to add something to the constructor. So I'm going to I'm going to add a optional parameter here. rectangle question mark bounds and it's going to default to null. And I'll put that down at the bottom here. bounds underscore bounds is equal to bounds. Okay, so now that we've got bounds in our object, let's check for our bounds. So in our update method here, we update rectangle. Let's check for bounds. Let's check for bounds after that. And let's add a private void method here, check bounds. Okay, so this is what we're actually going to use to check to see if our sprite's position, if our sprite's rectangle is outside of those bounds. If it's outside of those bounds, we're going to push our, our object back into the rectangle. So it's going to stick on the sides. You can change this to call a method to perform logic to where if you want to bounce it in a reverse direction or if you want to 
have it stick at a single location, you can do that too. But for this video, I'm just going to have it stick to a single location. I'm just going to push it back into the rectangle. Obviously, if our bounds are null, we are not going to do anything, so we can just return here. I'm going to use a change vector approach. So vector2 change is equal to vector2.0. So I'm using that approach to change our position. Our position is going to be updated by the new change values that we provide. If underscore, rect or if underscore rectangle dot left is less than or equal to underscore bounds dot value dot x. So if the left side of our rectangle is less than the x value of our bounds, change dot x is equal to underscore bounds dot value dot x minus underscore rectangle dot left. We're going to push our object back into the rectangle based upon how far we are outside of the rectangle. So that's why we use the subtract this here. So let's say, let's bring up the drawing tools here. And let's draw, uh, let's draw by color black. So this is the bounds here. And let's draw by red. This is the object here. So we know that the object is outside of the bounds. So this, let's say this is 20, and let's say this is 12. Okay, so bounds.value.x is 20. Let's change this back to black. Bounds.value.x is 20 here. And rectangle dot left, that's red. That's there. All right, so 20 minus 12, that will give us eight. So it pushes, change dot x is positive eight. So that will push, let's change this to yellow. That will push the object, uh, yellow's hard to see, just one second. Uh, blue, yeah, blue's good. So that will push the object plus eight. So that's gonna push that plus eight, so that way it's stuck on this side. So that is the math involved, and that's going to be the same on the top, right, and bottom as well. We just need to check that. So if rectangle.left is less than or equal to bounds.value.x, it's going to push it by the amount of the delta position between the left side and the left side of the bounds and left side of the rectangle. Else if, this is else because we don't need to test if the right side is over the bounds because the left side is already tested. So underscore rectangle dot right is greater than or equal to underscore bounds dot value dot right. So this is the exact same thing I discussed with the left side. Change.x is equal to underscore bounds.value.right 
minus underscore rectangle dot right. Now that's going to be a negative value because we want to push it to the left. The change of x needs to be negative, which means the object moves to the left. So this is, this is going to be greater than this, so it's going to be a negative value. All right, so that is the x component. Now we need to do the y component. If underscore rectangle dot top is less than or equal to underscore bounds dot value dot y. Change dot y is equal to underscore bounds dot value dot y minus underscore rectangle dot top. So that is going to do the same thing in the y direction for the top side. Now we need to do the bottom side. Else if underscore rectangle dot bottom is greater than or equal to underscore bounds dot value dot bottom. Change dot y is equal to underscore bounds dot value dot bottom minus underscore rectangle dot bottom. All right, so after all this is done, we need to check to see if change is still at the zero vector. If it is, we just do nothing. If change is equal to vector 2.0, if it's still that zero vector, we just return. We don't do anything. If it is not zero, we need to adjust our position. Underscore position is equal to new vector 2. We need to cast this as int. Uh, the reason we're doing that is because we're not going to have any decimal in the position values. Uh, you can make things a lot easier if you create your own vector 2 that's only integer. There's a lot of problems with having in vector 2s as floats because there is no decimal pixels. It's either pixel A or pixel B. There's no pixels in between A or B. So we're casting this as an int. Underscore position dot x, <coughs> excuse me, plus change dot x, comma. Cast this as an int. Underscore position dot y, plus change dot y. All right, after that is done, we need to update our rectangle again. And that is it for that method. Okay, and now let's go back to the game1.cs file. And let's modify how we call our constructor. So I'm going to add a game dimensions up top. And that's going to be a private read only rectangle underscore game dimensions. So game dimensions, and in the game one constructor, underscore game dimensions is equal to new rectangle, zero comma zero comma twelve eighty comma seven twenty. Okay, and in the initialize, I'm going to pass the underscore game dimensions into the debug sprite call. But as you see, we get an error message here. Because we modified the sprite, but not the debug sprite. So in the debug sprite, we need to add that optional parameter in our constructor. Rectangle, question mark, uh, bounds is equal to null. 
and then call base with that bounds. All right, so now we go back to game1.cs. And let's add zero there. Uh, we were missing the second optional parameter, which was the angle. The angle is defaulted to zero, but you have to specify it whenever you want to specify a different optional parameter. Okay, so now let's press F5 and let's see if this will work. Uh, looks like it worked on the bottom sprite. It was defaulted to be below the, the bottom of the circle was below the bottom of the game window. And the right sprite is stopped, and then the left sprite is stopped. So like I said, you can adjust this to fit your needs. If you want it to bounce back, you just change the method in the sprite.cs file. And you can call a... You can have it as event-driven, where you can call an event, or you can... Just set it up differently in this method if you want it to bounce back. Just reverse the direction. In a later tutorial, we will talk about vector reflection, which will, instead of reversing an effect, you do vector math to calculate a reflection vector based upon your approaching vector and the normal that the vector hit, and you'll calculate a reflected destination vector based on that. So just simply reflecting, you know, reversing the X or reversing the Y is not the best approach. You want to do vector reflection on that. And that will be a later tutorial. So I hope you liked this video. Uh, next video, we will discuss per pixel collision detection. It'll be two videos next weekend. It'll be the math involved with finding out the per pixel and how the algorithm works and then it will be the actual mono game video where we'll discuss the actual implementation on how to do per pixel collision last weekend we had a lot of stuff going on so i was not able to do that many videos for you i didn't put any videos up and i'm a little behind so there's only going to be one video for today next weekend there will be two as i mentioned let's just Bring up the mono game stuff here. Just to let you know the next few videos coming up. Next video, like I said, will be per pixel collision. The one after that will be rotating objects, then scaling objects. And lastly, that will be a three part series. So rotating objects, scaling objects, and then the last part will be matrix transforms. And then we're going to do a two-part tutorial, a transformed rectangular collision and transformed per pixel collision. So the next so next weekend will be the math involved with per pixel collision detection and then the algorithm of per pixel collision detection. The weekend after will be the rotating objects, scaling objects, and matrix transformations. Three tutorials and any math videos that need to be involved with that. So that's a potential six videos for two weekends from now. So I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.